Good morning. Let's open this morning's service with uh, a hymn from the hardback hymnal, number 18. Number 18, and let's all stand together. Now thank we all our God. Number 18. be seated. Good morning. We're going to continue our study in Hebrews chapter 10, the first hour this morning. Hebrews chapter 10. We had such a wonderful time in the first half of this chapter Wednesday night that I wanted to... uh, continue along those lines. So let's, uh, let's pray together, ask the Lord to bless his word to our hearts. Our merciful Heavenly Father, we come before thy throne of grace in the name of thy dear Son, thanking you, Lord, that we have an advocate, we have a Savior, who has been our sin bearer and who has satisfied once and for all all the demands of thy divine justice, putting away our sin, establishing a righteousness. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would give to us the faith to look unto him, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. We ask it in his name. Amen. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, says, For by one offering he hath, past tense, perfected forever them that are sanctified. What a, what a glorious truth there is in that one verse if the Lord enables us to see the Lord Jesus Christ having satisfied all the demands of God's justice, 
all the demands of his righteousness. And through his death, having perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now that word sanctified means to be made holy. As he is, so are we. All those for whom the Lord Jesus Christ lived and died are holy before God by the sacrifice that he made. In verse um, 18, the Lord says, Now where remission of these is, where, where remission of sin is, there is no more offering for sin. Now that means we don't, we don't add to what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. We don't, try to, we don't try to do something in order to make his offering for sin work for us. Truth is, the Lord did not make himself an offering to us. He made himself an offering to God. It's not an offering to be accepted or rejected by us. It was an offering to be accepted or rejected by God the Father. And God the Father was obligated to accept the offering that the Lord Jesus Christ made, being completely satisfied and pleased with everything he did. And so the offering's been made. There's no more remission. There's no more offerings to be made. There's no, no will, no works, no... Uh, uh, no special wisdom that we can achieve that it, it's done. It's finished. What a, what a glorious gospel. What is there for us to do? It's to believe. To believe. Look what he goes on to say. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We've got, we've got confidence now that we can enter into the very presence of God by the blood that the Lord Jesus Christ placed on the mercy seat. Not that mercy. Now, you know Hebrews is comparing the spiritual covenant to those physical types and pictures that existed in the Old Testament. And, um, and he goes on to tell us that there is a mercy seat in heaven, not made with hands. And uh, that, that's where the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was placed. And uh, this is not a physical thing. It's a spiritual truth. And the Lord says, here I will meet with you. When I see the blood, I will pass by you. <clears throat> Verse 20, by a new and living way. This word new means freshly slaughtered. And uh, the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus Christ has made to the Father is a fresh offering always on behalf of his people. It's also fresh to his people. When we hear the gospel, what a, what a great joy it is to experience the freshness of the gospel every time we hear it. It's not like this is, well, this is, this is you know, I already know that. Um, that's... that's Tell me something new. <laughs> no, don't tell me something new. Tell me the old, old story and might the Spirit of God make it new and fresh to my heart. All right, so in verse 22, he says, Let us draw near because we have a high priest with full assurance of faith, having our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, now that's where I want to begin. That's where we left off Wednesday night. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. What is the profession of our faith? What is it that we believe? Well, we believe that we were born into this world spiritually dead and at enmity with God. We believe that. We believe that we were unable to do anything to redeem ourselves. We couldn't see. We couldn't speak. We couldn't stand. We could not do anything to obligate God to save us in any way. Spiritually dead in our trespasses and in our sins. If we were going to be made alive, God was going to have to do it. 
And he was going to have to do it completely unconditioned on anything that he saw in us. I was talking to somebody recently. He said, well, you know, predestination means that God looked down through the quarters of time and he saw who would choose him. And therefore, because he has omniscience, he chose them. No. No. Number one, that doesn't even make sense. And number two, it's not the way it worked. No, God chose us in Christ, unconditioned on anything that we ever did. This, what, this is our profession. This is what we believe. You know, people say, well, well, we believe in Jesus. Well, yeah, but this is, this is who he is. This is how he saves. Unconditionally electing a people according to his own will and purpose before the foundation of the world. This is what we're holding fast to. We're not going to compromise that. There's no gospel without election. There's no gospel without total depravity. There's no gospel without particular redemption. We believe that when the Lord Jesus Christ went to Calvary's cross, that he laid down his life for the sheep. He didn't die for everybody. We don't believe that. We, we, we don't believe that it was an offering that he made for everybody. We believe that he effectually satisfied all the demands of God's justice for God's elect, particularly redeeming, accomplishing the salvation through his sacrificial death on Calvary's cross. We just believe that. We, we can't, this is, the, this, is the, this is the faith that we're holding fast to. We can't compromise it. We, we can't, we can't, Allow any leaven to come in. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now I know people listen to what we believe and they say, well, you're just, you're unloving, you're narrow-minded, you're, 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 you're not compassionate, you're, you're, you're mean-spirited. I hear all those things. But no, this is the profession of our faith that we're holding fast to, believing that he is faithful. And so we, we can't have a gospel without acknowledging our total depravity. We can't have a gospel without acknowledging the fact that God has elected, according to his own purpose, a particular people before the world began, unconditioned on anything he saw in them. We can't have a gospel without limited particular atonement. We can't have a gospel without that. Otherwise, it's just a universal atonement and there's no good news in that because now I've got to do something in order to make what Christ offered to me work. And that's not, that's not good news. If my salvation is determined by anything I do, I find no comfort in that. No comfort. Because I'm sure that I won't be able to do it right. There's no gospel. No gospel apart from irresistible grace. When the Lord, in his time, Paul said, when God, who separated me from my mother's womb, when he was pleased to call me by his grace. This is a, when when the Lord makes his people willing, they come willingly. (laughs) He takes out their heart of stone. He puts in a heart of flesh. He opens the eyes of their understanding. It's a work of grace. It's called the new birth. It's called regeneration. The Lord told Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You've got to be born of the Spirit. This is the profession that we're holding to, isn't it? We can't, we can't say, well, you know, we, we, yeah, God, God extends his grace and you can either accept it or reject it. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. Apart from God's grace being irresistible, there is no gospel. This is the profession of our faith that we hold to. Apart from the Lord keeping us and presenting us faultless before God, apart from him sanctifying us and preserving us and protecting us and uh, causing us to continue to believe, what do we call it? Perseverance of the saints. We can be better to call it the preservation of the saints. <laughs> uh, 
It's the perseverance of the Spirit that preserves the saints. And uh, what, a, what a glorious hope we have in knowing that, what do we believe? Here's what we believe in short. Salvation is of the Lord. From election to glorification, it's all of God. That's what we believe. And that's what the Lord's saying. Hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering. Don't, don't, don't move. Stand fast right here. Don't allow any, any error to creep in. For he is faithful that promised. Now the only way I'm going to stand fast... The only way I'm not going to waver on the gospel is if he remains faithful to me. I I can't depend upon me remaining faithful to him. But I can depend upon him remaining faithful to me. And let us consider one another. Now there's two things that we're going to talk about this in the second hour. Faith and love. Faith and love. He's talking about faith now in, in, in verse 23. It's the gift of God. And, uh, and now he's talking about love for the brethren, love for God's people. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Oh, I, we encourage one another to look to Christ. That's what I'm trying to do right now, to encourage you, encourage me to look to the Lord Jesus Christ. To consider one another. To know that we are members of the same body. We're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. And every member of your body is important to you, isn't it? Your little finger hurts. Your toe hurts. Your whole body stops and gives attention to it, doesn't it? And so it ought to be in the body of Christ. Let us consider one another. To provoke one another. To encourage one another. Unto love and good works. Now let me just pause right here and say... I think that most times believers lose sight of how important their attendance is in worship to the encouragement of other believers. I know you're here because you need to be here. You want to be here. <laughs> it's your, it, it, that's, you know, I, I, can't, I can't not come. I've got to hear the gospel. I've got to be saved. I've got to be comforted. I've got to find hope. But I want you to know also what an encouragement it is to your brethren when you're here and what a discouragement it is whenever you're not. And so uh, he goes on to say in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not here to try to put shame on folks for, for not coming to services. That's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about missing uh, for one reason or the other. Um, if, you, if the Lord has saved you and he's, he's given you a taste of his grace, you're going to want a lot more of it because you like that. <laughs> and this is where he's pleased to feed his children. So we're, we're not here to, to shame people. We're not here to manipulate people or to, to browbeat people for not coming. That's not even what he's talking about here. I know there's times things happen and you're not able to be a part of the services. Um, but let's read it in the entire context of this chapter. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more the, as you see the day approaching. So here we are. We're to, we're to consider one another, exhort each other, encourage each other. Knowing that your brethren have the same needs you have. They have exactly the same needs you have. Same struggles with sin. Same problems in this world. The same longing to see Christ. It's the, and so we're, we're in this together. And, but he's saying there's some who have forsaken the assembling of themselves. In other words, they came. They heard. They, they made a profession of faith. And now they have forsaken the gospel, and what have they done? What have they done? They've gone back. They've gone back to a a false gospel. It happens. It happens. 
That's what verse 26 is about. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Let me ask you a question. When have you ever sinned unwillfully? Every sin we commit, we do it willfully, don't we? It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about after having acknowledged the truth, after having heard the gospel, after having said those things that we just went over, what it is we're holding fast to. Yes, that's what I hold fast to. That's what I believe. And now going back and, and, and embracing a false gospel. That's the forsaking of yourselves as the manner of some have been. That's the willful sinning. You, you, you can't say anymore. Paul said, I was a blasphemer. I was an idolater. I was an injurious man, but I did it in ignorance. God has forgiven me. I did it in ignorance. And when we were engaged in a false gospel, we did it in ignorance, not knowing the truth. But now that we've heard the truth and we've said that we believe the truth... If we go back to the false gospel, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. There's, there's, no, there's no hope for salvation there. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. I fear, I don't know how to say this except just to say it. But I fear for my own soul that the lowest place in hell will be for those who have heard and confessed faith in the gospel and then forsaken the gospel and gone back to a false gospel. That, and I, I, That's what he's talking about here. And it ought to put the fear of God in each of our hearts. Oh, Lord, don't let that happen to me. Don't let me forsake the assembling of myself. Don't let me lose sight of Christ. Take not, David said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And every believer, though we have confidence in Christ... Though we, though we have hope in Christ, we're not so presumptuous to think that, well, we can, just, we can just forsake the assembling of ourselves. We can go all back to a false gospel and it, everything will be okay. No, it won't. No, it won't. Verse 28, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be he thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. Now he's not saying that, that he truly was sanctified, but he's saying he gave confession that he was sanctified by the blood of Christ and now... He has considered it an unholy thing. Now, you see that word unholy? It means common. It means common. It's universal atonement is what it is. In other words, here's what this passage is saying. Here's a person who's come and heard the gospel. Confess that they believe the gospel. Understanding, at least being able to give lip service to the, the, the truth of the gospel. The gospel is contrary to the false gospel in that we know that the blood of Christ was not common. It was not an offering made common to all men. It was a particular accomplished redemption for God's elect people. And now this person forsakes the assembling of themselves with the church and goes back to a false gospel that says, oh, God loves everybody, Christ died for everybody, and God wants everybody to be saved. And they've trodden underfoot the blood of Christ and considered the work of Christ to be a common thing. That's, that's what he's talking about here. 
And he's done despite to the spirit of grace. This is a... Uh, John speaks of a sin that is unto death. And he says, I do not say that you, could, you should pray for that one who has committed a sin unto death. This is what he's talking about. A person who has forsaken the gospel and gone back to a false gospel and embraced that and said, God loves everybody. Christ died for everybody. God. He said, don't, don't, even, don't even pray for them. It's a, it's a sin unto death. There's no more, there's no more place for, for salvation there. And here's the truth, brethren. If God doesn't keep us, we'll do that. We'll do that. And if we do that, if we do that, it'll be a sin unto death for which there is no redemption and to which the lowest do you know how rare it is to hear the gospel? You know how few people have actually heard the gospel? We, and for what the Lord's saying is, I have given you that rare opportunity to hear the truth. You've acknowledged it, and now you've forsaken it. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Lord, judge me in Christ and keep me in Christ. This is, this is, the, this is the, the heart of this passage. And this is what I hope the Lord will, will bring each of us. To confess. But call to remembrance. Why would we do such a thing? Why would someone do such a thing? I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen over the years here. Someone comes. They hear the gospel. They, they rejoice in it. They email me. They text me every service. After every message. And tell me what a blessing it was to them. And then you know what happens? Their family begins to blackball them. Members of their family begin to, to, to try to shame them and draw them back in. And finally, the pressure from family is so great that they forsake the assembling of themselves here and they go back to the false church where they were and they forget all about what they, what they agreed to here. Call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction. When you first heard the gospel, you experienced that, didn't you? You were ostracized by your family members. You were made fun of. You, there, there was an attempt to bring you back into the fold, wasn't there? It's every, it happens to every believer. And what the Lord's saying is, remember those days. Partly, whilst you were made a gazing, a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst you became companions of them who were so used. In other words, part of the, uh, of the persecution that you experienced was because of the confession that you made, and part of the persecution that you experienced was because of the people that you associated with. Oh, you belong to that cult. you following that preacher. You just... You, you, isn't it? Is this not? And the Lord says, remember what it was like then. And, you, and the Lord brought you through that. And he enabled you to remain faithful. And you didn't forsake the gospel then. For you had compassion on me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourself that you have in having a better and enduring substance. <laughs> you were willing to suffer. Knowing that, that the sufferings of this world could not be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in you. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. This was the confidence the Lord gave you when he first redeemed you. Don't cast it away. He's just admonishing us. He's encouraging us. Does the Lord keep us? Yes, he does keep us. Does he use 
the admonishment of his word in order to accomplish that end? Yes. And that's what he's saying. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Oh, what a, what a reward. Our confidence is in Christ. And our hope is that it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall see him as he is and be made like him. That's our reward, to be made like Christ. And the Lord is admonishing his church to perseverance. Don't be like those who have forsaken the gospel. Continue in your confidence in Christ. For you have need of patience. You need patience? Oh, Lord. You see, what God is admonishing us to do here is to call upon him for the grace to persevere. Lord, keep me. Keep me. Don't let me fall away. You have need of patience that after you have done the will of God. What is the will of God? It's to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. (laughs) Believe on him to the end. That's the will of God. He's not saying after you've, after you've performed your duty of law-keeping. He's saying after you have persevered and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you might receive the promise for yet a little while, and he that will come shall come. <laughs> oh, we have, we have no understanding of how brief this life is. I'm just sure of it. You know, we, we live by minutes and hours and days and weeks and months, and we just think time just clicks on, and, and we're, we're, we're so much like the five-year-old who's been put in the corner for time out. And he's only there for five minutes, but in his little mind, uh, he thinks he's been sentenced to a life of solitary confinement. You know, he's just, isn't that, isn't that true? He said, oh, this is just going to last forever. And it's just a few minutes. And we, and we, and we look at that little child and we think, well, you know, how, how immature they are and how little, we, God must look at us the same way. You know, we, we think, well, we're in solitary confinement for, for life, you know, and the Lord's looking at us and thinking, oh, my little child, you have no idea how brief this life is and how few days you've got. Lord, give me grace to reckon my time like you do. For yet a little while. Here's what God says. Just a little while. It's just a little while. That's what we would say to that little child. You know, it's just a little while. God says, just a little while, just a few more days. It's not long. And this is not... This is our hope, isn't it? <laughs> this is the believer's hope. Oh, we only got a few more days. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. For the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. We're going to live out this life by faith. We walk by faith, we look by faith, we wait by faith. It's all faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And I love the way this chapter concludes. Take a moment with me and look at verse 39. But we are not of them who draw back to perdition. That's reprobate. That's what that word is. We are not of them who draw back to perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of our souls. Oh, Lord, make me like that. Make me like that. All right, let's let's take a break.